Heavenly Father, once again, we love you so much. We are so thankful just for your glory and grace poured out on us. We're thankful that we can bring our failures, our addictions, our sins. We can lay them at the foot of the cross. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, that it empowers us to live lives that honor and glorify you. We thank you that even as we, we read in Romans chapter 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but we are not in the flesh, we are in the Spirit. We have your Holy Spirit living in us to empower us, to live lives that glorify you. And even as we continue to consider the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he told his disciples and that he's telling us today, I pray that we will be inspired to full commitment to following him. And we give you these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, we are continuing what, what, I, what I said last week is a kind of a two-part study of the issues of materialism and materialism as opposed to a full commitment to Jesus Christ. A couple of times in the Bible, Jesus made the statement, you cannot serve God and money. There's an old uh, movie from the 1980s. I know old is a relative term. Some people don't think of 80s movies as old, and some people do. And we've got quite a mix in here. But, but this particular film, we don't need to go into the details about it. It's an old John Cusack film. It was called Better Off Dead. But there's a paper boy that's kind of a sub-theme in the movie. This paper boy, this guy owes him $2 for his paper route, and he hasn't paid up. And one of the themes is, for some reason, this, this teenage guy is afraid of this, like, 10-year-old paper boy. It's just a funny, silly thing. But the paper boy's following him around everywhere. He just shows up at random times saying, I want my $2. And there's this one time where the, the guy, he's driving in a, in, a, in a station wagon, and all of a sudden, the paper boy's on the roof, and he starts banging a newspaper on the windshield and saying, I want my $2. And the guy starts swerving around the car, and the paper boy somehow is hanging onto the top of this car, just banging a newspaper on the roof saying, I want my $2. The reason I bring that up is because if, I, if I'm going to dare and dabble in some allegorical interpretation, it reminds me a little bit of so many people in the world we live in that are just fighting for a little bit of money and their obsession in life is ultimately to make money. And, and of course, a lot of times we're after a little bit more than two dollars but so often we're just thinking that that more money is the highest gain friends throughout the history of god's church god's church has almost always found its greatest ranks among the poor and needy in fact one of the reasons the christian faith overturned the roman empire is that Christians were the only people who cared about the poor. And believe it or not, in the days of the Roman Empire, there were a lot more poor people around than rich people. And nobody cared about the poor except the followers of Jesus who welcomed them in, who tried to get them food, and who, through this, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. The insidious thing about wealth, and we're not going to say that wealth itself is bad. We understand biblically it is a love of money that gets us into trouble. But the insidiousness of wealth is that sometimes it gives people this attitude of self-sufficiency. And the gospel is not about self-sufficiency. It's about what we were singing about, that we need Christ through his cross to save us. One of the great revivals in the history of Christianity is called the Great Awakening. And our three greatest preachers in the Great Awakening were, were three men in particular, Jonathan Edwards, uh, John Wesley, and George Whitfield. Wesley and Whitfield were, were partners in their early ministry and later broke paths because of a few disagreements. But both of them had an incredible preaching ministry, and one of the reasons they had a powerful ministry is they preached the Bible in a way that common people could understand. They weren't waxing eloquent about these deep theological terms that nobody got. They took the eternal truth of Scripture and they broke it down in a way that people could understand. And the poor and the needy started to come in, coming to Christ by the thousands during the Great Awakening. 
sometimes those who are particularly prosperous kind of struggle with this idea that everybody's equal in Christ. Oh, I'm wearing better clothes than that guy over there. Shouldn't I be better than him? I can, I don't know, I, I, I can give more money into the offering plate. Shouldn't I get some special privilege? I mean, any number of things that... God tells us when we come to Christ, we are all equals in the family of God. But one of the things we see, one of the grand ironies we see in our culture is how you have some churches out there that are kind of like the paper boy banging on the windshield, I want my two dollars, and that they're, they're trying so hard, how are we going to get some people with money in here so they can start dumping money into our plates? Well... There are many out there who are less self-sufficient and so ready to come to Christ because they have so, such an easier time recognizing their need for him. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. If the Lord has blessed you financially, it is a blessing and praise the Lord, and you can use that for his glory. We also don't set poor and needy above the wealthy as though they're more important in the kingdom of God when people get saved, but we do have to understand that God has a special heart for the poor and needy, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is always more important than material gain. That's true for a church, because we're confident in a sovereign God who has the ability to provide for our needs as a church, and that's true for us in, as individuals, because we're confident in a sovereign God who has the ability to provide for our needs as individuals. Last week, in our sermon, we met a certain young man, often called the rich young ruler, who Jesus gave him the opportunity to follow him, to become one of his disciples. But in this man's case, the thing that was keeping him from, from truly dedicating his life to Christ was his riches. So Jesus tells him, go sell all you have and give to the poor, and come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And he's like, wait a minute, not for me. In the case of our sermon today, we have Jesus following up on the discussion with the rich young ruler and giving his disciples a, a teaching here that's just very, very important for us to keep in mind. Mark 10, beginning in verse 23, it says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words but jesus said again the children how hard is it to enter the kingdom of god it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of god <laughs> the disciples were even more amazed and they said to each other who then can be saved Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So again, the question of today's uh, passage was brought up after the rich young ruler. And I want to share, you a few things, share with you a few things that people generally believed in the culture back then. This was true in both the, the Israelite culture at the t of the time and the Greco-Roman culture, which is pretty much everything but Israelite culture that we see in the Bible. Um, they had a different spin on this, but they had an idea that wealth was a sign of divine favor. If people are wealthy, God likes them. If they're poor, God doesn't like them. That would be in Israel. In the Greco-Roman world, it might be Zeus or Apollo or Aphrodite or one of the others, but it's the same basic principle. This is very popular among the religious wealthy. It's very, that's a very popular idea. Man, if I, if, I have, uh, if I have money, it means God likes me. If somebody's poor, it means God doesn't like them. And there's a really convenient 
corollary that a lot of people believed. If God doesn't want that person to have something, then I don't want to interfere with, with what God's doing, so I'm going to keep all my stuff for myself. That was kind of the, uh, the idea that we saw. Another thing you have to realize is that they didn't have economic systems in the way they thought about things in those days. However, if we were to be anachronistic and describe the, the economic system of the world of the New Testament, we might call it trickle-up economics. Now, if you, if you understand how that's different than, not saying Ronald Reagan was right or wrong, but if you understand how that's different than Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan was like the trickle-down, right? The wealthiest to the poorest. Well, the idea was people with money and land and titles, they felt like their goal between them and the gods or whatever was our job is to procure more money and land and titles for ourselves. And oftentimes this came at the expense of the poor and needy. So, so it was very deliberate. This idea of wealth as a sign of divine favor made for a very deliberate economic approach where the poor would get poorer and the rich would get richer. And they thought that that was kind of what the gods wanted because of their divine favor. And so, you know, every economist now at least claims they want to help everybody out. In those days, they weren't even making this claim. Now, when you understand the backdrop of this and the dreams of wealth that human beings have in all of this, it makes a little bit more sense why the disciples are amazed and then even more amazed about what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus is saying something that flies in the face of everything they've ever heard about money. Now, it doesn't fly in the face of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, which was the Bible of Israel at the time, there was no New Testament. The Old Testament was exclusively their Bible and said all kinds of things about loving and caring for the poor and how God has a heart and a love for the poor and the needy. But like so many today in the culture of Jesus at the time, many just kind of... Uh, ignored the parts of the Old Testament they didn't like and focused on the parts they liked or the parts that worked for them. I mean, there's a, a lesson there, maybe a mini application. We need to beware ignoring the parts of the Bible that don't benefit us or the parts that do. I mean, if we're like, oh, I love being justified by faith, but eh, this idea of uh, giving to the poor, I don't really like that idea. Yeah, that's not biblical Christianity, you know. Justification by faith is true and wonderful and, and believe in it. We are justified by faith and God, God commands us to care about the poor and needy. We need to not pit these things against each other. So the disciples in their amazement, well, let me back up a little bit. Jesus uses this great metaphor. I had a friend who once asked me, he knew I was a Bible teacher. We worked together at a job, but he knew I was also, I moonlighted as a college professor or teaching Bible. And he was like, Pete, do you think Jesus had a sense of humor? And I, I said, yeah. And I started to, to mention some of the things Jesus says that are funny, but we're so used to thinking of Jesus as this austere wooden teacher that we don't always realize he's saying something really funny. Like when Jesus said, talks, tells somebody, you, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. That's funny. When Jesus tells somebody, how many of you, if your son were to ask you for a, a loaf of bread, you'd give him a rock? That's a joke. It makes an important point, but it's funny. And here he says something else that's funny, and these funny metaphors uh, uh, help us understand what he's saying. He says, it's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to go to heaven, basically, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Occasionally, when you hear sermons on this statement, you hear this, this, this pseudo-historical background teaching that supposedly in the gate in Jerusalem, when they shut the gates at night, there's a special gate called the Eye of a Needle that was about that big, and if a camel scrunched up just right, the camel could just squeeze through the gate. There's no historical evidence that there was a, a gate in Jerusalem called the Eye of a Needle. Somebody just made that up because they didn't like what the Bible is saying here. 
kind of hard when people are making up things about historical background, but that, that wasn't true, and that kind of takes the punch out of what Jesus was saying. Let's think about that for a minute, just if you, if you want to understand what's going on. If you don't understand why city gates existed and city walls and gates existed in the ancient world, it's because you live in a world where if we go to war with somebody, we have drones that can drop bombs on people from above. They didn't have airplanes and hot air balloons and things like that. So if you wanted to attack a city, a wall would get in your way and a shut gate, you had to figure out how you had to get through that. The reason I bring all that up is because if you have this hole for camels to go through in the city wall, it's really not a good thing to have there because it's also a thing that, you know, wicked enemy soldiers can sneak through when the gates are shut at night. So that's really just a very silly thing somebody claimed. Just not true. Jesus is, he is intending to create an impossible scenario. A cam, it's harder for a rich man to enter into heaven than a camel get through the eye of a needle. So the disciples then ask, who then can be saved? And it brings us to the point of what Jesus is saying. They're still stuck on this idea that God likes rich people the best. So if it's hard for rich people to get into heaven, who's ever going to get there? Now, Jesus affirms that rich people can get saved. So don't, don't, don't misunderstand what we're saying here. He says, yeah, with human beings it's impossible, but with God everything is possible. What Jesus ta is talking about when he says everything is possible, he's using a rich person as an illustration of the fact that anytime a person, anytime a human being gets saved, it is a miracle of God. God has to give us new life. God has to soften our hearts. God has to show us the truth of the gospel. When I got saved, it was a miracle. When the poorest person gets saved, it's a miracle. When the richest person gets saved, it's a miracle. It can only be as a miracle of God. We call this the miracle of regeneration. And there I go with one of these big, you know, fancy phrases. But, but, or one of these fancy words. But regeneration means God gives you new life. He makes you alive again. Before we are saved, we are spiritually dead. He gives us spiritual life. It is a miracle. So, the point here is not that a rich person absolutely cannot get saved. We might say it's maybe, if we were to dare to say this, we might say it's a greater miracle because of their commitment to self-sufficiency. But the point here is beware making wealth the greatest goal of your life. We all live in a world, and even Jesus and the disciples lived in a world, where money is necessary for survival, of course. I mean, and the Apostle Paul, when he'd go on his missionary journeys in the book of Acts, he had to raise support, of course. I mean, the Apostle Paul and, and Peter and others, they acknowledged that in the churches in the first century, there were people with, with some wealth and people with no wealth, and the point was, they would always make is, everybody's equal before God, not that these people aren't real Christians and these people are, However, we have to recognize that wealth brings with it some special challenges of uh, self-sufficiency and, and, and a hard time believing the gospel because I've got it all together. I've got my money. So Jesus is warning against trying to serve money, trying to make having money the greatest goal in your life, and how this is incompatible with being a committed disciple of Jesus Christ being the greatest goal in your life. Now, in verse 28, Peter seems to be what, doing what he always does. The apostle Peter, he, he puts his foot in it. Sometimes I wonder if that's why my mother named me Peter, because Peter tends to put his foot in his mouth. He seems to say the wrong thing, and at first blush, we think, oh, there goes Peter again. He says, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? And here I'm expecting Jesus to correct Peter. I'm expecting him to be like, well, Peter, you still don't get it. It's not about you, it's about me. You shouldn't be worrying about what you're going to get. But what kind of amazes us is that Jesus actually kind of treats this as a legitimate question. Kind of like, instead of Peter, you know, knock it off, not again, he's like, okay, Peter, here's what you're going to get. Here's what everybody's going to get. 
And then Jesus, in verses 29 to 31, he makes this promise that should be an incredible, incredible encouragement to every believer. Now, what Jesus is not teaching here, he's going to talk about us getting things like, like brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, houses, lands, and all this stuff. We might even throw in cars and houses in a modern-day world. You have to understand He's not teaching this idea of prosperity theology that if you follow Jesus, he's going to make you rich. That's a, that's a heresy. It's a false teaching, and we want to stay away with that. And we know that he's not saying that because of this phrase. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little, but in verse 30, he says all of these things along with persecutions. Jesus promised his followers persecutions. We were praying for our brothers and sisters in Cameroon this morning. The persecutions are going through. This is, this is normal for the Christian faith. To be persecuted as a Christian is more normal than not being persecuted. And it's just as well that we, uh, we recognize that in case, you know, someday one of these groups comes knocking on our door. You have to understand, like we've talked about uh, many months ago, the Gospel of Mark was written against the background of a very severe persecution in Rome in the AD 60s, the, the, uh, when a really evil guy by the name of Nero was the emperor, and he, he had unleashed this horrible persecution on Christians. And, and Mark was written for this group of people, the Gospel of Mark was. And Jesus makes this promise that following him is worth it even in the midst of persecutions. He says, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the Gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, and fields. He's talking here about the gains and the benefits that come with being part of the family of God. Some people who, when they follow Christ, they have family members who say, well, that's fine, but you ain't going to have anything to do with me anymore. You want that religion? Chill. I don't want to see you anymore. There, there are, are families, there are religions, that people are like that. So unfortunately, sometimes people do have to choose between Christ and their family members. It's not a choice we make. We don't tell our family members, if you don't come to Jesus, we don't want to see you anymore. We try to lead them to Jesus. But sometimes they're like, we don't want anything to do with you. You could lose family members. You could, you could undergo persecution. But you gain Christ and you gain the family of God. And one of the things you gain in the family of God is the sharing that comes from being a part of the family of God. You have brothers and sisters in Christ who at times have, have, have homes and fields and things to be a help to you, to, to love and to share with you. This is some of what he's talking about here. Andrea and I, and some of you guys know the story, but we had to get out of a certain apartment many years ago. We didn't have any place to go. Uh, because of her, her severe allergy to, to mold. And there were a lot of people that opened up our homes to them during that time that, that we would stay with them at certain times. Other people raised money to, to help to pay for us to be able to stay in a, a cabin at a county park because cabins at county parks tend to not have mold problems. I had one friend, his name was uh, Ron Mears. He donated a lot of money to get us through our hard times. And he also let us... Uh, we had a, a camping trailer we lived in that he actually let us park on his property out in Alpine for a while, uh, rent-free. Ron, he, he was just one example of a kind of a... Now, I have a very good relationship with my father, who is a believer in Jesus Christ, but Ron was kind of like, almost like another father figure. I feel like in the family of God, I've, I've been blessed to have so many. I would just tell Ron, Ron is with the Lord now, and... Uh, entering into, you know, to, to, to the rewards of treasure in heaven, I am quite sure. But I would tell Ron, Ron, thank you so much for sharing what you have with me. Now, Ron was actually a pretty prosperous guy, too. And I, I would tell him, thank you so much for being willing to share what you have. And Ron would always tell me every time, well, well, it's the Lord's. Well, it belongs to the Lord. He believed that everything he owned belonged to the Lord, so he was willing to share in the family of God. Friends, when we come to Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, part of the reward of what we gain is each other. He says, in the age to come, eternal life. Now, you have to understand that the phrase eternal life in the Bible has a couple of uh, dimensions or a couple of aspects. 
Sometimes the Bible talks about eternal life as something that's currently already going on. And that's because when we trust in Jesus Christ, we get the first part of our eternal life, the new life, the new identity in Christ that guarantees what he'll do in the future. But sometimes the Bible talks about eternal life in its future aspect when God makes good on every promise he has made. When we are resurrected, when sin is no more, when we are perfected, and when he establishes his kingdom on earth. And in this context, Jesus is talking about eternal life in its fullness when we come into our resurrected body. Sin is no more and physical death is no more. And we are not there yet, but this is part of the the glory and, and wonder of what Jesus offers us. Jesus establishes kingdom, establishes his kingdom, we find in the Bible, in, in two phases, beginning with his millennial kingdom and transferring into what we call the eternal state. There's something that Jesus said in the parallel of this passage in Matthew I want to tell you about because it's an interesting point to ponder. Matthew adds, when Jesus is telling them about the rewards of following him, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, here he's talking about the twelve disciples, will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So part of the reward for the disciples is when Jesus establishes his millennial kingdom, there's going to be kind of a subordinate uh, ruling role for the twelve apostles. I mean, if we interpret the Bible literally, it's right there in Matthew 28, 19, 28. You, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, of course, that's talking about the 12. But if we dare to extrapolate, we might suppose that when Jesus establishes his millennial kingdom, those who have lived faithfully in this life might have some aspect of a, of a, of a role in his millennial kingdom, some sort of administrative role. I'm not going to say I can prove that, but I think it's a fair extrapolation from what the Bible tells us. Well, in verse 31, Jesus kind of brings us to a head. He says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Here he's talking about as a believer. We've trusted in Christ for salvation. We've come to him for his salvation, and we need to be thinking about the future. Those who try to serve their own ends are considered last in the coming kingdom. Those who put Christ first are those who will be considered first. This is something we need to be thinking about. If you want to hoard what you've got for yourself now, Jesus tells you the future might not have that much for you. Think ahead, think about the future. If you're willing to put yourself last and live for others now, God might have a very special and important role for you in the future that is related to this. The degree to which we live for ourselves rather than God will affect our role in the future. The degree to which we live for God rather than ourselves will also affect our role in the future. I kind of hesitate to use this illustration, but I'm going to do it anyway. In a sense, the way we live our lives now is almost like a job application for what Jesus is going to do with us in the future when he establishes his kingdom on earth. If you've never heard this teaching, if you've never pondered what Jesus said to his disciples here and this idea of rewards for faithful service, it's worth looking into. It can be very encouraging. It doesn't mean we're working primarily for rewards in Christian life. We're working We're living for Christ because he died for us, because he's given us new life, and we love him. But when life gets hard and persecution is setting in and we're going through difficulty, it's pretty comforting to know Jesus has special rewards, treasure in heaven set out for those who uh, will follow him faithfully. So friends, I just really want to encourage you as we bring this together to live for what really matters. Don't be like the little paper boy on the car, you know, just always, I want my $2, or I want to just get a little bit more for myself in this life. That's not what life is about as a Christian. Money will not last forever. People will last forever, and faithful service to Christ will last forever. Everything you do that's faithful service to Christ is like throwing a big rock in the middle of a lake. 
and there are ripples that go all the way to the edge of the lake. Only there's no edge of the lake. When you live your life in service to Christ, there are ripples of that that will spread into eternity. I had a friend who uh, who used to have a ministry. It was called his his ministry acronym was Alive, and Alive stood for always living in view of eternity. And when we think about what Christ offers us, and we think about the dangers of wealth, I just want to encourage you to live for eternity and to put Jesus first. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much, and we just pray that you will teach us to follow Christ and to put people first. Lord, whatever prosperity you give us, whatever, whatever financial blessings you give us, I pray that we'll always see that as a, even as my friend Ron used to say, as that it belongs to you, and we think about how we can best use the blessings you give us for, for the furtherance of your kingdom. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.